Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, my name is Maida Goldberg. I'm going to be the, the moderator for this uh, session. And we have a bunch of participants. Um, I'm going to just read you their bios in sort of order. And um, some of them are online, some of them are virtual, and some of them are in person. So there you go. That's, um, that's the diasporic flamenco world that we all live in. Um, so uh, we're, we are starting uh, with uh, René Heredia, who is one of the foremost flamenco guitarists of today, form, performing as a solo guitarist and guest artist. He has performed with many illustrious flamenco artists, including the legendary Carmen Amaya. He has recorded multiple albums, has produced award-winning shows, most notably for Flamenco Fantasy Dance Theater, 1968 to 2021, and performed around the world. Maestro Heredia is a direct descendant of the Gitano Flamenco Puro traditions as passed down to him by generations of his gypsy family, which hail directly from Granada, Spain. His father, a pure Spanish gypsy, taught his impressionable young son the intricacies and elegance of the rich form of expression. Everything he learned about the flamenco art, its history, and the people was passed on to him by his father and later instilled by his mentors, Carlos Montoya and Enrey de Flamenco Sabicas, flamenco guitar virtuoso. As a performer, teacher, choreographer, mentor, and recording artist, Maestro Heredia is credited with bringing flamenco to Colorado and has received numerous awards, including the Governor's and Mayor's Awards for Excellence in the Arts. And following uh, René's intervention, which is going to be some videos that I'm going to show, unfortunately he couldn't uh, connect up by Zoom, is Pedro Cortés. Um, who comes from a family of Spanish gypsy guitarists and began his studies with his father, Pedro Cortes Sr., and the esteemed flamenco guitarist, Sabicas. Having toured professionally since the age of 17, Pedro was known internationally as a soloist and composer. He has toured and performed with illustrious flamenco artists such as Jose Greco, Farruquita, La Tati, Merce Esmeralda, Manolete, and Lola Flores and with several opera, major opera companies. He has composed for major theater productions from New York's Joyce Theater to the Teatro Albeniz in Madrid, as well as for film and television, and has published two books on flamenco. He is artistic director of his own flamenco group and also musical director of Palo Seco. Mr. Cortes is a third generation flamenco guitarist and uses the experience passed down to him by his family to maintain the purity of flamenco while creating new compositions. And I'm just gonna make a little insert here before I introduce Estela Satania, who's also with us today. And that is just to say that Pedro and René share um, the fact that they have a Gitano legacy in the, in the, di in the diaspora. Right, so these are people that are establishing flamenco traditions within their homes here, some of them in the United States. And, um, and also, my legacy is with them. So I have known these guys since I was a kid, <laughs> practically. And I want to introduce um, in that vein Arturo Martinez. Unfortunately, I don't have your bio here, but I will just say that when I got back from Spain in 1985, the first thing I did was a show in Carnegie Hall with Maria Alba and Vittorio and Arturo playing for me. I think you like found me or something like that. Yes, I found you in Philadelphia, <laughs> and I worked out something with you, <laughs> to who I discovered you, John, oh, you were already, but Julio, you know, told me about you, and we worked on a tango, and I wanted you to audition for Victoria and Maria Alba, and you came, and you were and the chosen rest is history. to perform <laughs> So this community, just to say, is, you know, we're, we've all, you know, we're family. Okay, and then last but not least, I want to introduce our... Um, wonderful uh, presenter who is in Jerez right now, Estela Satania. 
began studying flamenco singing and guitar at the age of 11, eventually touring with the Jose Greco Company as the group's singer before moving to Spain in 1971. After a decade singing for dance companies and in tablaos, she formed a traditional flamenco group that maintained an intense schedule through the year 2000. In 2001, after writing for various specialized publications, she began writing for theflamenco.com. I'm sure you guys have all referenced that incredible resource. In 2003, she was awarded a research grant from the Spanish government and the resulting work, Flamencos de Gañanilla, was voted best flamenco book of 2007. In 2004, she received Spain's National Prize of La, La Unión for flamenco journalism, and the following year, the same recognition went to theflamenco.com. Founding member of the cultural forum, Moron 2004, she was a regular panel member of the Flamenco radio program Los Caminos del Cante for 10 years and contributing writer for print publications such as Voz de Cádiz, Acordes de Flamenco, Nueva Alborea, official publication of the Spanish cultural ministry, Sevilla Flamenca, Almacien, and El Olivo, among many others. She has collaborated on such books as Flamenco Project, Una Ventana a la Visión Extranjera, Cañeta de Málaga and 100 Years of Flamenco in New York, which I co-curated. Settled in Jerez, she has been guest speakers at flamenco festivals in Albuquerque, Miami, Amsterdam, New Delhi, Buenos Aires, Nimes, and Monte Marsan in France, the Biennale de Sevilla, Festival de Jerez, and numerous flamenco associations or peñas throughout Spain. She is currently a bilingual contributing writer for the digital resource Expo Flamenco. So welcome to you, Estela. We're going to turn the, the screen off for Estela now. And I'm going to go to uh, showing you some video. So I'm going to just play you some snippets um, from some uh, interviews that I did with René Heredia and his um, wonderful niece, Andriana Cortés. I, I really am, she's the one who made this all happen. And Pedro um, made this happen. Um, and I'm going to start by... by playing a little bit about René's uh, father. New York in 1919. And when Correct. did he land in, in L.A.? Like, when did he end up in L.A.? Somewhere in the uh, early 1920s. Uh, yeah, that was that big European uh, 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 migration from all over Europe, Italy, you know, Spain, from all over. They were because America allowed all those people to come in. Right. You know, yeah, immigration it, movement back where they would all go to Alice Island and get you know uh, checked in and make sure they didn't have any diseases and stuff. So the the story goes, as I understand it, uh, the story goes that he. Uh, migrated from New York to Chicago, landed in Chicago to start up his ironwork business of those decorative, um, you know. Uh, no, what happened? And then, Let me interrupt you. And then, Here's the Chicago story. <laughs> My father was in Chicago, and he got together with an Italian guy who was a baker, and so they opened a bakery shop. And my father and this Italian guy were partners in a bakery shop, and they would work the bake. Shop. But lo and behold, the mafia came, which was called La Mano Negra, That's and they, they told him, you got to pay us protection money. Protection and, money. Yeah. yeah, and my father said, I ain't going to pay you anything. <laughs> and I said, no, I ain't going to pay you anything. I'm not paying you anything. So one week went by, the next week went by, and they threw a bomb into the bakery shop and blew it up. And so my father said, well, I'm not going to stick around here. Not for all this. So then from there... He went to Texas, and he didn't like Texas because they all thought he was a Mexican. And he said, "Yo no soy de México, yo soy de España." <laughs> and so he was there for a while, and it was real hot all the time. So then he went to California, and he loved California because it was early colonial Spanish. The weather yeah. was beautiful. It looks like Spain. All the streets were named in Spanish: uh, Olvera Street and, and Los Angeles, Los Feliz. All oh, these streets were named, and Papa, my father said, Ah, aquí voy a estar, porque esto es muy bonito, es como España. 
And so that's where we, uh, he settled there. Didn't wow. he? Also, it's because he also heard that uh, there was other Spanish gypsies that were living in Los Angeles. Well, there were now some. the other. Living. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to go now to 648, please. So that's um, René talking about his father. You didn't see the picture of his dad, but he's like devastatingly gorgeous. And he came to the United States in 1919 and sort of migrated westward. He was an iron worker. And he, he, uh, he made a lot of the iron work that, you know, the kind of Spanish style LA architecture, he, would, he did a lot of that. And he had 11 children. And René is, I think, number 10, if I'm not mistaken. And they, are, they became flamenco artists. So it was just like it happens, you know, in Carmen Amaya's house or in every, other people's houses. Like, in their house, they're doing flamenco all the time. So then by the time they're 10 or 11, they're out in performance in public. OK, let's do this one. Mm -hmm. Out as a solo concert guitarist, like Carlos Montoya. Right. So, he told Carmen, Mira, después de todo esto me voy a ir. I'm going to go and, and start my solo career as a soloist. So, you know, then she was left out without Sabicas. So Carmen and I said, well, what are we going to do here? I go, we have to have another guitarist. And so Kuro Amaya, Carmen's nephew, who is Paco Amaya's son, right. him and Diego are Carmen Amaya's son. He said, right. she said, he said to Carmen, I know a guitarist who knows all of Sabicas' material. And she said, ¿Qué, ¿qué es? She goes, she's from the Heredia family. She said, well, tell him to come and, and see me. So the next oh day I went to Detroit. I was only 17 then. Wow. And wow. she said, siéntate. And she was in a huge uh, 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 king-size bed, a little dark black thing with the covers up to here. All you could see was her face. And she was watching Walt Disney Funnies. <laughs> <laughs> She loved cartoons because she was when she was a child, she never did all that stuff. She was always dancing, you know. So she said, uh, come in, sit down, get your guitar out, now play Sigiria for me. Okay, now play Solea. Okay, now play Buliria. And I would do a snippet of each because she kept saying, I ought to do this, I ought to do that, I ought to do this. So once I played for her, then she said, fine, report tomorrow. So then I report <laughs> day. And I was in Carmen Amaya's group, and the first show that we did together was uh, at the Palm Springs at the Chichi Club. And so my sister, Fatima and Soraya, came with me, and Carmen Amaya had her group, and me and uh, my two sisters, and we debuted at the Chichi Club. It doesn't exist anymore in Palm Springs. Then my sisters went back to L.A., and I continued with her uh, on the tour, and we went all through the southern part of California of the uh, United States, we went to Miami, then we went to Cuba, and then we went to San Domingo, then we went to the Virgin Island. We did all the Caribbean, see? And then in 1958, I believe it was, mm -hmm. Castro was coming into the city, and we were working at a five-star hotel. And Carmen came in one day and said, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. And I said, why? She said, no, we have to go pack up everything, let's go. And I said, what about the contract? She said, well, we're breaking the contract. So Juan Antonio flew her from Havana directly to Madrid, and they put the rest of the company on a 1929 Spanish steamer, which was called La Covedonga. And, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, 1929. And we went from, the Canary, from Havana, Cuba, to the Canary Islands and took us seven days. And then from there, we went to Algeciras, from Algeciras, we took the train to Madrid, and we started rehearsing to go to Russia. But then, wow. Franco, then Franco told Carmen, you can't go to Russia. That's a communist country. And if you go, you're going to lose your passport. And Carmen said, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to lose my passport. Wow. So, you know, because Franco was anti-communist. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going to Russia, we went to Paris. Wow. We toured all of France twice. And we went also to Scotland and England. And then while well, we went back to France, we were touring. Then they called her from Barcelona because they were going to inaugurate her, the Fuente de Carmen Amaya, uh -huh. which was the statue of Carmen. And they put a new fountain at the, in the Somorostro <coughs> where Carmen was born. And the Somorostro used to be shanty town for the gypsies, right by the ocean. 
and uh, so they they uh, we did uh, we did the Teatro Barcelona, which doesn't exist anymore. And then I worked at the Palacio de la Musica with Carmen, and we also worked at the Palacio de Deportes with mm. Carmen. And then we started a tour again. So we were always touring, and a couple of times we had to stop because the contracts that didn't, and Juan Antonio was trying to drum up more contracts and that kind of stuff. Mm. And so I worked with Carmen for at least three or four years. Wow, And I amazing. also played the guitar for Fosforito, for Jarrito, and for Juanito Varea on the Festival de Carte Grande. And we toured all of Spain, and then we wound up in Sevilla. And when we got to Sevilla, we did the shows and everything, and it was going to be our last concert. But then uh, we all, you know, went to the dressing rooms, and then they came and they told us, we can't pay you the mat the, uh, the promoters st stole all the money. He <laughs> took all the money and split. So oh they were all concerned because, you know, he had all these people uh, that he needed to pay. So uh, Fosforito said, well, all I have is joyas, you know, gold, this and gold. And, and, for, and uh, Jarrito had a little bit of money in the bank. So with that, and Fosforito sold all his jewels, they oh. had enough money to pay to get back to Madrid. Oh, my God. So then, <laughs> Antonita Moreno, who is a beautiful woman from Sevilla, very famous for the Saetas. She was uh -huh. in Madrid and he hired me and Mertro de Marchena was her guitarist and Mertro left it so they hired me to play with her. So wow. I worked with Antonita Moreno and we toured all of Spain in Los Reinos de España. Wow. And I played the guitar with El Guito uh, uh, and with... Uh, uh, with all the, with Mano, Manuel, esto, Mario Maya, and mm -hmm. Lati, Lati, when she was 16 years old, because oh, I used to play Torre Bermejas wow. with, uh, with one uh, Avichuela and uh -huh. a bunch of other and a bunch of other gypsies and stuff. Wow. And Juan and I hit it off right away, and he would he would keep telling me, put me in that falsetta, because I had some falsetta by Esteban de San Luca, and I had falsetta, of course, a whole bunch of stuff from Savicas. So, and you know, all that was brand new. Because Amicas wow. was a legend, but nobody ever heard him play. Nobody, you know, a lot of the old men knew him when he was back there in the 20s and 30s. But when Savicas' Flamenco Puro record came to Spain in 1955 or 1954, I was working at the Sico Prise in Madrid, and Ina wow. Ricardo was there with me, and they had a record player. They put on Savicas' record. And it just blew everybody away. And when he would do that real fast picado for Soria, uh, Nino Ricardo would say, Ole! Ole! <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Nino Ricardo had uh, throat cancer, so his voice was real dark, and, you know. And I'll, I'll stop it. I'll stop it there, but. Um... There's a lot more where that came from. I, I did four interviews with him and they're just incredible. And um, so he's talking about kind of the time, he was born in 1939. He grew up in this Flamenco household. He got, you know, his dad went backstage when Carmen Amaya came to Los Angeles in 1943 and said, you know, yo soy gitano, like, you know, let's be friends. And they, you know, they, they went to her house and to his house and, eight, because <laughs> yeah. that's how it goes. And so then later, um, when Sabicas was leaving the, com the company, and this is in 1956, I think, René comes in to substitute, and then he gets, of course, he goes on tour, he ends up in Spain, he's working in these tablaos, and he's teaching people this material that's coming from, from yeah, from the United States. So that's just super interesting. And then there's more after that too, but I think I'm gonna hand the baton over to you, Pedro. And do you want me to pull up any of the photos? Sure, you can pull up some of those photos. Is this, it's Tengo voz de locutor. ¿Esto lo hacemos en español o inglés? No, in English, please. I'm sorry. Habla inglés? Lo, lo justo, ¿no? Cataluña, estoy ahí. <risa> Scolta. Es <risa> lo único que sé. A ver, ¿qué va a poner? Tell me which one. 
Oh, are you, no, we have to take Estela off so that we can see the pictures. There Mira, okay. ahí estoy yo, ahí estoy yo con Paco de Lucía en la playa. Oh, I'm sorry. Here I am with Paco de Lucía. I'm here on the right. We're at the beach. He's vacationing with his two kids. That's Curro, who actually gra graduated with a film degree here in New York City. Wow. And uh, that was in the 80s. We hung out a lot uh, in the 80s because Paco still was fresh. This was after his first tour that he did with the Sextet. And uh, he wasn't burnt out then, so he wanted to hang out all the time in, that, in, those, year, in those years. What else do you Pedro, have? I want, actually, before we go on and tell us more about the photos, I want you to turn around and talk to the audience and tell them about your family, tell them about your background, tell them how, who you are and bueno, how you came to flamenco. I'm, I'm going to start from the beginning. I haven't written any books, but I have three generations of experience, and everything that I know has been passed down to me by older flamencos. And sometimes I get a little bit upset because everybody's so upset with Don Porin and Morón de la Frontera, and we forget that the main contributors to flamenco guitar started with Ramón Montoya. Ramón Montoya was the first one that created a lot of the techniques that we have in flamenco, we stole from some of the classical people, and he did a lot of the arpeggios que eran orquillado, orquillado arpeggios, and some of the five tremolos and stuff like that. We owe that to Ramon Montoya. And we don't talk about Miguel Borrul. Miguel Borrul had a picado that was like Paco de Lucia's picado in going back, century back, you know? Nobody mentions these people. Nobody, nobody mentions, nobody mentions uh, Nino Ricardo. Paco de Lucia played everything from Nino Ricardo when he came to the United States. He changed when he saw Mario Scudero. He recorded Impetu. Impetu is a piece that's Mario Scudero's, not his. And he recorded Los Panaderos, which is not Paco de Lucia either, Esteban de San Luca. Nobody mentions Esteban de San Luca either. So there's so many influential composers and guitarists of that time you know, uh, apart from Sabica. Sabica's influence was totally Mario, uh, totally Nino uh, Ricardo's influences. If you listen to Sabica's and you listen to Ramon Montoya, I'm talking to Mario Ricardo, I'm sorry, and you listen to Ramon Montoya, a lot of the influences came from Ramon Montoya. Everybody forgot about Mar Mar Ramon Montoya. What, you know, all, everybody has all these different influences. What about who created? We couldn't have the guitar if it wasn't for these influences. When we, when we mentioned uh, La Fernanda, La Utrera, for example, when she did the couplets, the majority of the couplets were recorded by Juan, Juan Maya Marote. Juan Maya Marote did a lot of the recordings. Juan Maya Marote was the one that created our abanico. Rajeo, this Rajeo? He created that. And I asked him, inclusive, why did you create that Rajeo? And he told me because his pinky was too small <laughs> and he couldn't put his pinky in to do the five finger Rajeo. So then he, he, came up, he came up with the Rajeo, which is the abanico. He told me that personally. So that's one of my main things that, you know, I want to I wanna make clear that there's so many influences that everybody forgets. I recorded an, an, an album, and I called it Los Viejos No Mueren, <laughs> because I could not record or do anything that I did without the influence starting from back then. My grandfather migrated to Argentina, leaving the Spanish Civil War and all the problems there. And at that time, Ramon, Ramon Montoya went through there, and my, dad, my grandfather used to hang out with Ramon Montoya. Wow. So, you know, most of the stuff that I'm, everything that I'm telling you has been passed down to me by people that have told me, and, the, and I used to hang, Sabicas is my sister's godfather. So Sabicas was in my house every other day because we were the only other gypsy families that were here. And he would call up my mom and say, you know, prima, cousin, can you make me a potaje? Can you, can you make it with habichuela and bede garbanzo? You know, you know, because I'm really craving. And my dad would have the car, so he would go pick him up and bring him over to the house, and he'd be over there. And Mario Scudero was also my father's compadre. My dad baptized Mario Scudero's son, Rabón. So these were the three, we were the three gypsy families that lived here, mainly. But another thing that people don't mention is that during the World's Fair, the best artists in Spain were in New York City. 1965. They weren't in Spain. 
They were here. We're talking about Los Habichuela, Los Pelao, eh, La Fernanda, La Bernarda. I have pictures of La Fernanda changing my brother's diapers, <laughs> you know, in that era. The cream of the creme was here, was here in New York City for, for, for a long time, you know. So a lot of, and the, and the, and the artists that would mention Jose Greco, the artists that used to come here to work with Jose Greco, they do one tour with Jose Greco. They go back to Sevilla and they'd buy a house. One tour. That's how much money they were making. In those days. <laughs> it, it was crazy. So, yeah, um, I met Paco when I was a kid. Paco came uh, to work with Jose Greco. There's a picture, I think, that uh, that's up there with him. Is, of this, that. is this the one? No, that's a picture of my family. Actually, this is my family line over here. That, up, that picture back there. This is me with Paco. This is me at the beach also on vacation. There's Paco with the kids. Uh, that was here with Paco. You want to go back to the family one? No, there's one that's not here. You put it in the, in the brochure. Oh. The picture that's in the brochure. Ah, yeah, yeah, the, which, is, which Estela is going to talk about, and she has in her PowerPoint. Right. So El Pelao, turn... Pelao was there. Uh, Rafael Negro, que era. A ver, ¿quién más? Right. I don't know who he was. This is Mario Scudero. That's my father. Creo que está Rafael Negro en Paco Lucía. He was 16 when he came to work with Jose Greco with the promise that he was going to bring his brother in soon as a singer so they can be together. And I met Paco in those days. So I knew him since I was a little kid. And we'd always wind up, you know, in those days he uh, actually... Because somebody mentioned about Paco coming here. The person that brought, the, one of the first people that brought Paco here, that gave him his first concert in Carnegie Hall, was, um, oh my God, my name. Saul Hirock. No. No? No. He gave him Carnegie Hall, was the guy that I don't quit strings, uh, Juan Orozco. Juan Orozco produced his first concert in Carnegie Hall. He's the guy that created, he was the one that created the machines to make the guitar strings. He had out on Quest strings. And he's the one that gave Paco Lucia his first concert in Carnegie Hall. My dad actually accompanied him into Dos Aguas on that concert. So I was backstage with him. I was like, I was like uh, 15 or 16 in that era. And he brought Casilda with him. They weren't married then. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. And he, stuck her, he snuck her and brought her into New York City. And I, I met her then. Um, what else? I mean, so oh, she wanted me to tell a story about uh, soccer game. about Paco and, and his soccer. Paco was a fanatic, a soccer fanatic. And when he when he came here, we were hanging out. We used to hang out in a, in a bunch of clubs. One of them was La Sangria, and the other club was a place called La Paella in Spanish Harlem. And we were at the Paella, and he was playing all night long. I was like, he was playing. I was sitting on the floor right in front of him, like, ugh. And uh, he mentioned about that he loved soccer. And the owner had a son that had a soccer team out in Westchester. <laughs> and they said, what, your son has a, your son plays soccer? I go, yeah, he has a team. Ah, but we can beat, and Paco said, we can beat those kids. Yeah, you're going <laughs> to beat 17, 18-year-old kid? Yeah, I'm going to put together a group of flamencos here, Nicolás and a bunch of the waiters were Spanish waiters. <laughs> They said, we're going to beat the kids. So we went to a park out in Westchester, and Paco didn't have any shorts or anything. The other guys brought shorts. The kids were all in a uniform. And Paco didn't have any shorts or anything. He <laughs> took off his pants, and he played in his boxers. <laughs> and it was pouring rain. There was, like, mud all over the place where they were playing. And Paco tried to kick the ball in, and he tripped, and he fell down. He was all full of mud. <laughs> and... The kids beat them to nothing. <laughs> and all the flamencos were blaming each other. <laughs> no, porque tú que no sé cuánto, tú que el otro. It was hysterical. <laughs> so that was in the era where Paco was not burnt down and he would come. Sometimes he'd get off the airplane and go straight to La Sangria to hang out. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of the time, Sabicas would call my father. Compadre, come on over here. You know, Paco's coming over to the house. Please come over here. And I, I remember one day we went over to the house, and Paco was there. Actually, he came from California. He was there with Rene Heredia mm. over at Savicas. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one of the first times that we were together with Rene Heredia. And they played all the time. And, 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 and Paco would only play Sabicas Farsetas. And Sabicas would say, Hijico, come on, play, play some of your stuff, play some of your stuff. <laughs> but Paco had such great love and such great respect for Sabicas. In fact, Paco came to the United States to get uh, Sabicas when he passed away. And, and he's the one that fixed it to take him to Pamplona, wow. where he's buried. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think that's it, no? Okay, well, if that's it, I think we'll, I, to be continued, but let's turn on, we're going to now turn to the video that Estela has recorded, and then Estela's here, and we'll all get together and have some questions. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Maida Goldberg, and I am here with the esteemed Estela Satania, um, who is the author of Flamengo Senganyania and the prize winning Flamengo Senganyania, and also um, the, uh, uh, the head uh, brains behind the Flamengo.com, which I'm sure all of us have accessed many times. Estela. You have lived this uh, Flamenco world. You've lived in the Flamenco world for all your life. And I know you knew Paco personally um, in New York and have some memories uh, to talk to us about um, Paco in New York. So take it away, Stella. Right. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, knew Paco personally. Let me just clarify that I know him superficially. Yes, we coincided in certain events, and um, I was certainly at the, his quote-unquote presentation, an informal presentation, which I will describe, but we weren't intimate friends. Mm, we were both very young, for one thing. We're from the same year, 47, wow. and uh, he didn't talk much, and I was kind of quiet also. And Well, let me give a little backstory first. Um, the, Paco's relationship with New York and the United States begins, I would say, in 1962, when he and his brother win a prize in Jerez as Los Chiquitos de Algeciras. And at that point, 1962, Jose Greco, the great dancer, had his company. And he always had an eye for talent, and he would scoop up people like this. And he, he immediately, or soon afterwards, asked Pepe, not Paco, but he invited Pepe to join his group, uh, which Pepe did. And no sooner was he there, and he was lobbying to get Paco included as well. Um, they did something in California. There's a California era of 1962. Three or 64 that I don't know much about, except that Manolo Baron was there. Um, at one point, Paco left the group, and I believe he returned a second time, which is when I mm, start rubbing shoulders with him, so to speak. In 1965 or 60, the winter of 65 to 66, either December 65 or January 66, Paco hits New York with the Greco group. And at this time, uh, I was taking guitar classes with Mario Escudero, the great guitarist, Mario Escudero from Alicante. He was not well known yet, but he wasn't, he just was not known. He came to New York and he was giving classes to make a living. And little me was one of his students nowadays sounds silly that I studied with someone so great. It's like saying I studied with God. But um, pa, uh, Mario was a great teacher and great involvement in the New York flamenco scene. Uh, I want to add one little divergence, which is of Domingo Alvarado, the singer from Jerez, who set up in New York in the 60s. And he was part of this movement also of let's present Paco to the world kind of thing. And he has this anecdote 
well, it's, he's told it in other documentaries, but it's so good. He took Paco up to meet Sabicas because this was one of the things that Paco wanted most was to meet Sabicas. Takes him up to Sabicas' apartment, Sabicas' place, whatever they talked about, I don't know. And then Domingo is in charge of getting Paco back to his hotel. And according to Domingo, no sooner did they hit the street and Paco is going, I can't believe it. He's so clean. He, he doesn't miss a single note. I just can't, can't believe it. He just kept on saying that. But it's a very cute anecdote because um, it reflects Paco's admiration for, for Sabicas and for the guitar in general, obviously. Right. We'll leave Domingo aside. Um, right. This, what I'm calling the presentation. <clears throat> <clears throat> it was one of these things that at the time it seems totally insignificant. You just go and you just want to get on with your life. But now, 60 years later, <laughs> eh, I realize it was a very important moment. How did it come about? Well, I was studying with Mario twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday, five to six. And one Tuesday, he after the class, he takes me by the shoulders, and he's a he was a huge guy, and I was so small, I was about sixteen or whatever. And um, he says, "Listen, tomorrow, you are to be here at seven o'clock." And I said, "Well, I, I don't have class tomorrow." He says, "You just you just, you just be here. You be here." I said, "Why?" He said, "There's going to be a, a boy your age." who plays guitar really well. I want you to see him. Some other people are coming. There aren't going to be a lot of people, but I want you to be here. I said, I really don't. He said, you just be here. <laughs> there had been a huge snowstorm, and the streets of New York were with slush this deep. <laughs> the last thing in the world I wanted to do was traipse out into the slush to see some kid to play guitar. But Mario said I had to go, so okay, so. Um, this was a studio that Mario had set up with the classical guitarist Juan de la Mata. They had it, the studio was all painted in black. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. This was Mario trying to be modern, I guess. <laughs> no. Oh, really? <laughs> We're moving into the future. But he was, by then, he was completely enthralled with Paco, as was only natural. And uh, he was, well, Paco was his protege, really. So, okay, so I get up there, go up the steps. I mean, the, there are no more than 10 or a dozen people, dozen people at the most. And Mario was serving little glasses of wine. And we're all just, you know, like kind of, kind of being there and let's get on with this. And at some point, Mario comes out and says, will everyone please step into the small studio? Because he had a studio within the studio. It's the way I remember it. And that was the little room where he gave private guitar classes. There was uh, maybe three meters square. I don't know. Not much. Not much room. No chairs. We just stood up. I'd say 10 or 12 people at the most. And when we get in there, Paco is sitting in literally in the corner, like he's being punished. He's sitting in the corner with his guitar and looking down. And Mario starts to explain just a couple of words that this young guitarist, who I want you to see, and he's so wonderful and very short, very brief, not too much ceremony. And he glances at Paco and Paco goes like that and his his dress at that time, he was dressed like the Beatles. You know, he had a string tie and his thin lapels. He did not cross his legs. Everyone wants to know if he crossed his legs. No, he did not. Um, started playing. The way I remember it, I think he only played two pieces, possibly three. It was no way that it was presented as a recital. It was just like, get, get a listen of this guy. That was the idea. See who he is. Um, the first number was, was a free form number. Might have been Rondeña, 
might have been Granaina. It was one of those free form styles. And there was no applause. It just, he finished. I mean, it was such a small venue. It would have been silly to applause. And then he played, I'm pretty sure, Bulerias, which by then and that was getting pretty exciting because Bulerias and Paco's hands is very special. All the while, these people, I'm trying to remember who was there. Luis Vargas, the singer, I'm pretty sure was there. I'm almost positive. Um, Bob Strack, a guitarist of New York, very terrific guitarist. Juan Sastre, John Taylor, if you get it, Juan Sastre. <laughs> <laughs> and um, everyone was very like, what's, what's, what? everybody was buzzing, you know, but who is this person? Where is he from? Now, all of a sudden, because there had been a lot of talk about this event, mini event was going to happen. But nobody knew exactly what to expect. Yeah, so a kid who plays guitar, big deal. What? Lots of people play guitar. But once we were there and we started hearing it, and it was everyone was pretty much floored. The um, the maturity, the phrasing, the depth, the technique, and um, I mean, he's such a young guy. Uh, maybe we can now have that first photograph. I just have two images. The first mm -hmm. photograph there puts Russ. I guess I'll see it when it shows, right? Yes. Can you see it, Estela? Oh, ah, there it is. Okay, okay. It's very terrible quality. The the man with the spoon is making paella in his house. That's Mario Escudero wearing his bathrobe. <laughs> and this was a, an informal social event at Mario's house. That's Paco doing his goofy adolescent face, <laughs> like saying, wow, paella. Uh, <laughs> so this was the type of thing that Mario was doing. He was bringing him into the ambiente and introducing him to the social world of, of Flamenco in New York at the time. And the other image is the one that's more interesting, or maybe that's I'll say. stop the share and then go to the other image. Right, this is a very important picture. Um, from the dress and the way Paco's hair is combed, he had lots of hair back then, and his little tie, and this would be within days of the presentation that I just described. It was the same as it. Estela, I want to stop you for a second. Excuse me. Sure. I'm just not sure that we're I'm, that we're seeing the right one. Let me um, let me stop the share, and right. let me just make sure make sure I'm doing this right, because uh, I want I want to make sure that this is visible on the screen. Let me try it again. Sure. Okay, can you see it now? I can see it big now. I see it now and I saw it before also. Okay, <laughs> what I was saying was that by pa Paco's dress and hair comb, this is within days of the presentation that I just described because he's got that little tie and the little skinny lapels and he's got three Coke bottles lined up in front of him <laughs> while he's <laughs> sitting with these mm, important flamenco people from left to right Pepe de la Isla is the singer who was with um, Greco at the time. This is the Greco group. Not all of them, but some. Mario Scudero, who's there, because you can see by his grin, he's basically saying, what do you think of Paco, huh? That's, you have to assume that's what he's... He wants everyone to know Paco. <laughs> then comes Pedro Cortez, father of the present Pedro Cortez, who was not with Greco, but was part of the inner group of the New York flamenco. Then we've got Rafael El Negro, who, yes, was with Greco, I believe also with Matilda Corral, his wife. And there's young Paco. And this is a historic moment for flamenco and for Paco, for Paco de Lucia, that um, it was the beginning of this incredible movement into the future, I would say. Uh, no more 
No more was it Sabicas and Nino Ricardo. Well, they were still very well loved and revered, but now the new king, Paco de Lucia. We only suspected it back then. We didn't really know it. We were still pretty, pretty much with, okay, well, let's get on with the show. Who's next? No, Paco, this was a very important beginning. And I really don't know what else I can say about this. And I'll just, I'm going to stop it there because we're already grossly over time, but maybe we can just take five or 10 minutes for just questions. Estela is here with us, so maybe we can bring you up on the screen. There you are. And um, does anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? I, I just want to say something that during that era, Paco still played everything from Nino Ricardo, but after the experience of seeing Mario Scudero, he recorded a couple of his pieces, and looking at Sabicas, that's when he created his own style be, just from what he experienced watching these two monsters, you know. And that's when he came out with Puente y Caudal, which was totally different from anything he recorded prior to that. Estela, you can, I think you should be able to just speak if you would like to, if you have any comment to make. Um, I just wanted to say that it was to see your father, you your father, I worked with him a lot with him when I was. It's kind of hard to tell. It's just like it. I'm hearing it twice. So why don't I just. <laughs> Unless someone has a question. Paco. Yeah. Una pequeñita, pequeñita. Bueno, para el otro. Eh, eh, ¿se, ¿Se escucha? Okay, okay. Se sí, escucha. Sí. Nada, que muchísimas gracias a ambos dos ¿no? por esta presentación maravillosa que nos lleva, me conecta con el congreso de Flamex que organizó tu querida Cristina Cruces Roldán en, en, en Sevilla y que, y que creo que faltaba esa perspectiva de no flamenco en América, sino América en el flamenco. Bueno, eh, una preguntita, la guitarra esa que está tocando Paco, ahí jovencito, ¿de quién era? ¿De alguno de esos cuatro? O oh, con, no. ese, con, ese, con ese golpeador sí. blanco. Yo no me acuerdo porque estaba chico, pero él siempre tocaba con de hermano. La guitarra que siempre tocaba era de con de hermano. Siempre. The, mic, the microphone. Perdón. Yeah, the question was, uh, who was the owner of the guitar that what play, Paco yeah, what, is what playing? What guitar was he playing? And I, I said that Paco always played con de hermano. And uh, he was the first one to order a negra and started playing una guitarra negra because it was considered a classical guitar, you know, into flamenco. I don't know if Serranito might have played one. But actually, dead guitar, he's playing there. I think I played dead guitar in his house. In whose house? Flamenco, Paco's house, in his apartment. That guitar, he, did, he was playing the negra when I was at his house in Mirasierra. Yeah, but this is the sex he was already playing This is the in the 70s, yeah. He yeah. had a guitar that he really liked, uh, that he played in the... Uh, Fabulosa guitarra de Paco Lucía, that was a real flamenca, flamenca. Yeah, and it looks like the no, guitar Barcelona, that Silva. he would have around his house, but I was there in the 70s. Yeah, but he always, he always played Conde Hermano. Conde Hermano was his favorite Conde, instrument. Yeah, Conde. De Gravina. <laughs> any, any other question? Any other question? Okay, well, thank you. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, all. Yes, uh, so we're going to gather again at what time? I think it's at 2.30. Uh, unfortunately, Rafael Riqueni uh, cannot perform tonight. And we were supposed to have also a tertulia, a conversation with him. So uh, the artist that is going to play instead of Rafael Riqueni is Alejandro Hurtado, great guitarist, obviously. And we hope that he's going to be here at 2.30. And we hope, because it's been a last minute change. So, uh, and so we're going to gather again at 2.30, and we're going to have our conversation with Alejandro Hurtado. Uh, so that's at 2.30. And then at uh, 3.15, we're going to have our last uh, session, and we're going to have two papers. One paper is Juan José Telles Rubio, who is a biographer of Paco de Lucia, a longish kind of paper. And then David Leiva, 
and Paco Betancourt. Uh, they're going to do uh, a paper. They're going to deliver a paper in duo, kind of. <laughs> and they're go also going to perform, I think, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> We have a guitar already, so uh, we'll see you, we'll see everyone at 2.30, okay, thank you. <laughs>